Hey guys, welcome to the channel, or should I welcome myself back in fact. The last video I posted was entitled Death at Work Story, okay? Well, I'm not dead, but I used to be. Following that video, I began to get ill. Feel ill. Or, simply put, my condition worsened. What I was unaware of was simply that I, had, I was already in end-stage heart failure during the time of me making that video. And soon, I was going to be the next to flatline. Not once, but nine different times. Now, I'm not sure if you guys are even aware of my Instagram profile, but that's where I posted a lot of pictures of the street bike that you see in most of my videos. And little snippets here or there of little goofy car builds that I got into, like a weird, weird little 350Z drift project car that I modified lightly, threw a body kit on, painted, and then sold. You know, made a profit. Uh, yeah, the red BMW, that, that red car is still good. She's actually inside the BMW shop right now getting worked on just a little bit of maintenance, uh, the AC compressor. Uh, the 335's actually got some upgrades a lot that you won't find here on YouTube, but Instagram's in fact not even loaded up with all the latest on the 335, but I, I've got her straight piped going all the way to the back now. We're boosting 19 PSI, taking down everything left, right, and center. Uh, the last car race was a Corvette C7. And as soon as I mashed on the accelerator, or my brother, my brother was driving my car, and I told him, I was like, Josh, like, get the hell out of my car and let me drive. Like, I want this body, you know? I was like, I want that C7 under my belt. And he was asking me, like, Chris, come on, man, let me do it, let me do it. So I applied. So I was like, go ahead, Josh, like, give him, give him the beans, you know? So as soon as my brother hit the accelerator, all I remember is the whiplash that I felt in my neck when I turned to the right to look at that shiny yellow Corvette drift off into the distance behind us is my 335, like, didn't walk. Walk would be an understatement, but I was just like, just like pounced in front of, I don't know, just I like ran off on, yeah, that, that's a little too obvious. But anyways, my Instagram account, I'm gonna link it in the description below. That's got all the pictures. That's got the picture of when I got the card for a piece of life-saving equipment I had to wear called the life vest, which was an external defibrillator that you wore like a bra under your shirt that would shock you back to life if you went to a fatal heart rhythm. Well, that happened. I was at home, wife and kids, couch, evening, after work. After dinner time, not too far from bed. We're in the life vest. We already knew I had heart failure at this point, but we took it head on and said we're gonna get through it no matter what. But I got the picture of that card on my Instagram and uh, Sure enough, we were watching Lion King 2, I believe it was. We were about halfway through the movie. I told my wife, I said, I think I'm passing out. Then I woke up to my wife and my daughters screaming frantically at the top of their lungs on the phone with 911. While I woke up, covered in my urine-soaked trousers, my jeans from work. And my chest was soaking wet. I couldn't figure out what was wrong with my chest. So I grasped it. And it was soaking wet with the blue gel. And I was like, what the fuck 
is this blue gel? Like, what is this? Well, apparently that life vest that goes on underneath your shirt to make contact with your skin to shock you back into a regular heart rhythm, that thing disperses like a gel when it goes off to increase the conductivity when it does have to give, like, deliver a shock. So that happened. I woke up. You know, ambulance finally showed up, took me to my hospital. And I sat inside one of the one of the uh, one of the IC units I'd worked in before. Just briefly, it wasn't like my main spot, but I'd been up in there before servicing equipment in there. And um, hung out there. After some you know, time had passed, a couple hours, I suppose. Uh, helicopter showed up front. That was for me. I took that. I took that helicopter ride from Ridgecrest, California, to Loma Linda, California. I sat. I brought it. My body fell apart. I had to get a gold bladder drain put in me. No pain meds. My heart was too weak to take it. The drop in the blood pressure would have killed me. I never would have woken up from the anesthesia they put me under. So I had to. I had to do that pull surgery, the full installation of that whole bladder drain. No pain meds, no sedation, begging for death. And I got that gold bladder drain put in. I got an internal defibrillator put in. It was an IC, I think it was ICED or ICUD. It was an internal cardio defibrillator, so ICD something. <sighs> that was cool. That surgery they were able to put me out for. So I don't remember getting that. Uh, but I woke up, you know, with like a Zippo lighter size object inside of my chest. And I'm left-handed, so I couldn't hold the phone with my left hand anymore because it could interfere with my pacemaker, my pacemaker internal defibrillator combo. But I got through that and said, "Fine, I can live with this. You know, like we'll, we'll push on. The gold bladder will get better and." I'll live with the pacemaker, like hell, I'm only 30, but I'll get on with it. But I didn't. I never did. I got shocked a lot from the pacemaker. Eight more times to be precise. And it hurt like a son of a bitch. And the dying was never the scary part. It was coming back that freaked me out. I don't know how to explain that feeling. I guess it would be similar to Just to use words of my vocabulary, give it my current mindset underneath all the medications I'm on. Fear, shock, angst, petrified.
Like you're awake and then you just wake up again. And it got bad to where even the internal defibrillator couldn't keep, it couldn't bring me back. So even with the pacemaker shocking me, the pacemaker defib combo shocking me on the inside and the paddle shocking me on the outside wasn't enough. Luckily CPR brought me back. So I lived at Loma Linda for like a year. The cardiac unit, ICU. I come home for a day or two at a time, but then I go back for weeks. The heart got worse. And then the progression worsened. So we had multiple issues. At a, with the heart failure, there was cardiomyopathy, so I had a swollen heart. At a heart valve, I had a regurgitating heart valve to where it wasn't pumping all of my blood back out of my heart. And then I had to deal with the electrophysiology, the electrophysiologist department. I had electrical issues with my heart. And how did it go on notice all these years? I never got sick, man. I never went to the doctor, even when I did. <laughs> I never went to the doctor, man. I just, I worked, get my head down. <sighs> Rode when I could. Worked as much as I could. I loved my work, man. Like those that know me, like, I was the first one to work, last to leave kind of guy. Like, it was my shit. It was a hobby I got paid for. So I lay dying in Roddick in Loma Linda. Over the course of a year, not necessarily admitted the whole time, I'd fight to get out, right? Christmas came. birthday came, Thanksgiving came, family came, they came to see me on holidays, even snuck me in food one year on Thanksgiving, I was too sick to eat it. My only wish that Thanksgiving was that I was healthy enough to be home to peel potatoes so I could enjoy Thanksgiving dinner surrounded by all my family and loved ones. Holidays came when I got sicker, got sicker faster. The disease sped up. Mama Linda put a device inside of me called the Impella, which helps your heart pump the blood through your body. It had to go in through my groin. I was bed bound, completely immobile, shitting in a bedpan. Could hardly breathe, couldn't walk. I only drink about a thousand milliliters of water a day because my heart wasn't strong enough to process that extra amount of liquid. It would only make me worse. I was parched for years. Not by force, but by my will to live. And then even with the impella, they couldn't slow down the progression of the heart disease. It was too far gone. So, they had a meeting at Loma Linda to see if they could save me and what it was gonna take and if they can do it. So they had to talk with me and my family about getting a machine called an LVAD, a left ventricle assist device. They told me, of course, what the procedure would entail. 
and what life would be like after. Quality of life, what to expect. Um, and then if I was going to be a, a candidate to receive a heart transplant, not everybody gets one. You have to be a candidate. You have to meet a lot of requirements to be a candidate to get a heart transplant. Because when they select a person for a heart transplant, what they're looking for is longevity. How long of a life are you going to live after you get the heart A? And then B, what is the quality of that life that you're gonna live after? Amongst a massive list of other qualifications that a candidate has to meet or exceed to get on that list. Well, Loma Linda decided what it was going to take to save my heart and my life was going to be a bivad. So not just the left ventricle assist device, but also a right ventricle assist device. So essentially I was going to have two heart pumps inside of my heart circulating my blood for me. And they didn't do that procedure there at Loma Linda. So obviously, that was good news to hear that I can get two heart pumps to save my heart and my life. But the bad news was that Loma Linda didn't do that. So it was either stay on and keep fighting with whatever measurable amount of strength I had left in me. Just go rest, big dog, go take it easy. I wasn't done yet. So I held on and sure enough, San Diego came through. University of California, San Diego, to be exact, specific, to UCSD. They said, you know what, they looked at everything, they looked at my health records, my charts, and they said, you know what, we think we can do it with the LDAT here, with our team, and we can get it done. So, Waited in Loma Linda for the transfer. At some point a helicopter showed up for me and my massive machine. Because the Impella I was hooked up to was a massive machine. The helicopter was too small. It was like the smaller helicopter I rode in prior. Where you're just kind of like in like a single size shoe compartment fitting next to the helicopter pilot. And it couldn't fit me in my machine. So we had to wait and another one came up. Another helicopter came, it was red. I remember that, it was a big red one. And uh, they flew me to San Diego Obviously I was dying, right? They could no longer keep me alive at Loma Linda and I needed to know that immediately. I'll never forget my doctor, James. He's the one that came and got me off the roof. He stayed in ICU for a couple days. Then I was told about the LVAD, the seizure, the procedure, what they'd have to do to me, the risk versus the rewards. <laughs> that was a guaranteed outcome if I didn't take a risk. So I took that risk. 
family came. We prayed up until the last minute. They gave me that dose to put me under for the procedure of the anesthetic or the anesthesia, excuse me. And I woke up on the other side. Strapped to a hospital bed. Which is normal for me by now, I'm used to it. When you wake up from anesthesia, your hands are strapped down so you don't immediately yank up and rip the cord out of your mouth. Understandable, right? Well, I woke up, I made it. So, they saw my chest didn't have what they saw. Medical grade, of course, it wasn't a hacksaw, but they saw my chest didn't have. And they cut a hole about the size of a quarter in my heart. And they sew it in pretty much like a flange or a fitting to connect this metallic heart pump to them. And it did, it was a constant flow of blood. I didn't have blood pressure. I didn't have a heartbeat. They had to use a special piece of a medical equipment called the Doppler. It's a Doppler scanner where they check through your foot. Because when you have the left ventricle assist device, the LVAD, you don't have a heartbeat. You don't have the contraction, the beating, the thump, thump, thump of your heart, right? Because your heart's no longer doing the work. I forgot what it was. I forgot what settings, my old bad settings were. But I had a flow, I think it was flow per minute of the amount of blood that my pump was flowing for me. And uh, that was a really nice treatment option. That's called a bridge to transplant. <sighs> it's a bridge to keep you alive until you can make it, hopefully, until you get your heart transplant. The only thing is, is this pump flowing my blood for me non-stop, day and night, 24 hours, was that it's gotta get power, and where's that power coming from? The external source. So I had a power cable from my heart pump that came out of my stomach about three or four inches to the right of my belly button. And it's all on, it's, there's pictures if you want to see the deeds, but I've already lived it. I just figured it was time to tell my story. <sighs> okay, so everything's beautiful now. We've got the old bed. Heart slowly getting better. Gold bladder drain came out. Happy about that. But unfortunately, there were other issues that came along with it. Because I went from weighing 190 pounds down to 116. I went from 190 to 116. I lost every bit of muscle and fat on my body because all my organs started shutting down because there wasn't any blood flow for so long. So there's a new operation. Now I have to get a feeding tube put inside of me because I don't eat normally anymore after the gallbladder drain placement. 
So now I have to have a feeding tube and get nutrients and my pills crushed up. And I have to feed them to myself through a straw, a big tube coming out of my stomach. But it works. The LVAD works. My old heart, well, it's gonna need the heart transplant no matter what because of the electrophysiology issues with it and the heart disease associated to that. Um, the, the cardiomyopathy, uh, the regurgitating heart valve, it was still gonna have to be replaced but the LVAD took off a lot of the workload from it. And it was able to get better. And I was able to eat and put on some weight. I got another man's heart put in my chest. <sighs> I'm not gonna cry like a bitch. <sighs> this was my first coherent Christmas. <sighs> With the heart. Obviously, getting the heart put in on 10-10-2020 still recovering on Christmas or my birthday and on New Year's but this year I had time to think and reflect but I did I got my heart transplant and I'm gonna be fine and this man's heart is gonna live on in my body. And his memory shall never pass. And his loved ones will never be forgotten by him. <laughs> never. He'll never be forgotten by him. As long as his heart's beating. His heart will never forget about this man's family and the gift that he's given me in mine. Forgive me. <sighs> this is 
So that's where I've been. <sighs> oh my god. <sighs> now we can talk quality life after transplant and where I'm at today. Where I sit at the time of uploading this video. Well, unfortunately, it hasn't been all rainbows and sunshine with the heart transplant. There's risks that come along with both of these operations that you're made aware of. And of course, you sign. If I would have known that I would be the way I am today, instead of not dying, I would have chose to stay alive and be where I'm at today. But I'll tell you this, just on the physical side of things, not the mental, or emotional. I do that heart transplant or that LVAD surgery 10 times. If I didn't have to deal with my neurological issues ever again. I've been riddled with seizures. It's been a month, thank God, since my last seizure. I can't drive anymore. Six months of no seizures. Then we're looking back at getting on the road again. I still have the great BMW. I've got plans on putting a GoPro on that. I've been going out street racing in Lancaster. Well, I was, even when I had my fucking heart pump. I took that BMW out to the Lancaster Palmdale area and was out there racing people chewing shit up in that 335. You better believe it. I want to throw the GoPro inside the 335 when I'm allowed to drive again, but for everybody that's subscribed here for the sport bike content, I got to keep it 100 with you. I would to my new heart never to get on a bike the rest of my life. A bike. Bikes had nothing to do with my heart failure. That's genetic. But unfortunately, our lifestyle is different. It's risky, right? I've already had my chest cracked twice, man. What kind of honor would that be for this donor's family if I hopped on a bike and not me? I'm a protective rider. I'm a safe rider. But you know the biggest threat to us on the road is other cars. Because they're, they're in a fucking cage. We're not. We're exposed. We're dangerous out there. Dude, all it would take would be for one car not to see me. Or me to see one, not me, not see one car. Because I drive for everybody else on the fucking road. All it would take would be, would, you see, when I talk about the neurological issues, this is what I mean. <sighs> the issues wouldn't even be the other drivers on the road. All it would take would be for me to slip up once and not see a vehicle, the one on my sides, and get T-boned and crack my chest not twice, but thrice, and have that shit puncture the heart. Or put my body in even worse shape than I'm currently in. So there won't be any more street bike content on this channel. Dude, the number on my bike was 28. Always has been, always would be. But the issue is this. Well, the importance of 28 was simple. That's how old I was when I started to ride street bikes. 
So obviously then, in life, I was already well off. I got a good bike. You know, I already love the lo I already love research, science, knowledge. So I researched everything I could about street bikes. And I went out and I practiced techniques. I watched sport bike, uh, super bike school videos on how to get onto a track. Cause I had dreams of going and doing track days back in the day. I would watch these YouTube videos and learn their techniques. I would read about body positioning and techniques, how to prep for a turn before you go into a turn. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like your body position and your leaning angle, like according to the apex and shit. And I would go out and practice these things in the streets. The only reason I stopped making street bike videos and went more to the car ones was because I had a great opportunity for a house and I only needed a little bit of money, man. So I sold that badass street bike, dude. All the, like the fairings, the old fairings, dude, the new parts with the dyno too, dude, all my gear for only 2,500 bucks, dude. So I went and got a sick ass house and I definitely had plans to go get another street bike especially when I got out with the LVAD man like I couldn't wait to go purchase a, like the new R1 <sighs> and I didn't care that I had to have my heart pump in my backpack with the batteries so I didn't die if I got stranded and I was fine with that like I had plans on that but it never came to fruition I had a short love affair with street bikes and I'm fine leaving that where it is. Because the past, it is that. The past. That's where it belongs, right? That's why it's there. The past isn't now, so let's just let it be in the past. As far as I can say from things that I've learned from the heart failure and dying nine times, having my old heart ripped out of my body and another man's put in, is that happiness is here in the now, in every waking second you have, it's here, it's now, it's just up to you to find it, it's just up to you to find it, try not to put your happiness off in the future, maybe this might be a familiar sight, <laughs> this is where my last video ended or began and ended so <sighs> we're gonna end this in the virtual BMW definitely not as fast as my shit in real life though <laughs> just kidding but happiness is now you can find a reason to be happy, but don't, don't place your happiness into the future because then it becomes elusive. At that point, is it really happiness or is it faith in happiness? Because let's say for me example, let's say I wanted to go cop the new M3, which I totally fucking want. Because you can only, you can only get, you can only get the manual if you get the four door. It just so happens I'm a four door whore, so I would love to get that. But see, that's placing my faith into the future. I don't possess the funds to go out and buy a brand new M3, and I'm fine with that. But where do I find happiness? Outside of that is the fact of knowing that 
just right now that I'm sharing my story to a bunch of people that have known of me in another life. I do have a show us a good story to tell. Uh, but I can't tell you what's going to happen in the future. You're probably looking at a bunch of people coming over from the Warframe community. I've had a lot of time to play games lately. And even that slowly being taken away from me slowly by sh like slowly but surely because of the amount of medications I'm on and, and my seizures and my neurological issues following the transplant. Um, there's a plethora of uh, unpleasantries that you don't hear about when you hear about somebody getting a heart transplant. There's a lot that's not publicly known or thought about unless you're in that kind of predicament or situation. They cut the nerve from your heart to your brain and reconnect another heart's nerve to the nerve going to your brain. The term for this shit is called cerebrovascular. That's your brain heart link. I'll leave it on that note, but I will let you guys know what I've been up to in my personal life. Other than gaming. Obviously physics. Um, AI, AGI, artificial general intelligence. Singularity Net, if you want the name of a company. Uh, if you want to know the name of somebody in the AGI field, go ahead and look up a guy called Ben Goertzel. He's the top leading scientist um, and researcher. He's over 60. He got his PhD like back in the 80s, I think. Um, and they're about to be releasing open source code AGI. Uh, that's decentralized meaning so it's the highest advanced artificial intelligence software in the world uh, but it's an open source code and it's decentralized meaning nobody can ever fucking own it that way no government entity gets their hands onto it because that's not beneficial for humanity Obviously, governments, right? Corporations, they're motivated by political greed. We all know this. Uh, but this open source code, and it's already like established, it's got like blockchain type technology inside of it. It's very fucking advanced. If you've ever seen the Sophia robot that talks with Real Smith, Sophia robot, she's actually a citizen of Saudi Arabia that has rights there uh, he's the creator of the artificial intelligence software inside of that robot um, so I've been spying, spending a lot of my time uh, with them and their communities very small obviously because just throwing out shit like op like just like free cog open source code uh, you know decentralized shit like that like that throws a lot of people off so you know you're, you're talking to the real guy when you hear shit like that flow out of my mouth right um so anyways he he works with Hanson robotics obviously right because they designed the robot that housed the software for sophia but the actual software sophia doesn't belong to Hanson robotics uh, they're actually about to start mass-producing a robot called Grace. 
uh, which is Sophia's sister, who's actually been working in Japan already last year in COVID units. Like, she looks like a human, talks like a human, thinks like a human, can respond like a human. It Like, she takes temperatures and everything of the COVID patients while she's in there, uh, helps them. Uh, so, mark my words, by the end of 2025, you're going to see spectacular miracles happen in the world. Unlike anything the world has ever seen, created by man, uh, for the benefit of man. This is all about man and my, mankind. This community is a very small-knit community. And it's all about freedom, uh, freedom from governments or freedom from this kind of shit getting into the wrong hands. But by 2025, you're gonna see marvelous works that you would think would be divine, but they're not. They're man-made. But anyways, this was an update on where I've been for years. I've been sick. Longer than years, because who knows how long I had the, un the undiagnosed issues before. Well, I mean, my diagnosed issues, how long, who knows how long, I don't, since probably before 2019, and as it stands today, I still can't drive, uh, on occasion I use my cane, depending on if it's a good day or a bad day, I definitely don't go out in fucking public. I haven't been, been on public in years, really. Been dying in hospital for years. And then when I got out of the hospital, everybody was wearing a fucking face mask and paranoid. You think I knew what the hell was going on? Nope. I felt like fucking Rick Grimes from The Walking Dead, yo. I walked out of the fucking hospital like, what the fuck happened to the world while I was gone? It was a fucking nightmare. And on top of that, since I have a new heart, I think I'm pulling up on my base here in LA. I think we're hopefully headed the right way. But as soon as I get there, I'm gonna call it good. Um, don't remember what I was saying, but regardless. Looks like I'm gonna be fine. I've still got issues, neurological. We're looking, the next set of tests is to go look inside the graph site. So the next test is to go inside of the new heart from the left and the right and check for swelling where the new heart connects to my old body. And that does happen where the scar tissue builds up on the inside and it results in blood pressure issues and I have that which honestly I don't know what I want more if I want that or if it's Cerebral vascular and it's dealing with the nerve that connects the heart to the brain then I don't know I really don't want to take more pills But this shit needs to get dealt with because I had more of a life with my heart pump Than I feel like I have with the new heart right now And that sucks man I had a dream. I still have dreams of going back to work. But I can't go back to my old line of work. <sighs> Since I have a new heart, I take anti-rejection medications. Because if not, my heart's going to start rejecting the foreign object inside of itself. <laughs> it's going to start rejecting the new heart. So taking anti-rejection meds means that we're lowering my immune system. We're immunocompromising my shit. 
The way my immune system is weak. And I don't reject a new heart. But at the same time, if I go out in public and catch COVID, I'll probably die. Dude, this does look pretty close to the girl in real life. I got pretty close to it. <sighs> at least in the front, man, but... Expect people to come over from the Warframe community, because I stream on Twitch over there, and, uh... I'm probably going to start sending Warframe people over this way because the Twitch stream is growing. Uh, we're almost at affiliate status, which is really cool. Which means I'll start making money off that. I've got money now, but I'm just honestly really concerned about keeping the Warframe community alive brings me a lot of pressure to give back to the, a lot of pleasure to give back to the less fortunate in that game. But I've owned you guys this update for a long time. And well, yes, I've got the heart transplant and I'm going to be okay. I still hope for a better tomorrow. For you guys as well, I can't even imagine all the stories you guys have individually from the time that you first came to my channel to today, through the pandemic, you know, things that have happened in your lives. Some of you guys have been here for years. But honestly, man, whatever God you pray to, I hope they bless you and your family. <sighs> With health, freedom and peace of mind, man. You guys take care. This is Tubal Attic slowly turning into John Broadman Prime. <laughs> Signing off, you guys. Take care.